One of my favorite things on this earth is reading because I'm an annoying little rat and I don't have anything else to do and I like to play games on this YouTube channel so that's why this is what it is. So today I will be rattling off a couple poems that I love, grading on and on about why I like them and so on and so forth. Hopefully you enjoy it and if you don't that's not my problem. As a quick disclaimer, I am not a professional in any of this. I write for work sometimes but that's about it. I don't have an English degree. I am not a professional analyst. I'm just here to have a good time around and find out, you know what I mean? And I think that poetry is beautiful and it should be shared with as many people as possible and maybe that comes from my dumb ass. So let's just get right into it, you know? I'm gonna start off today with some of Emily Dickinson's work. Let's go sapphics. Emily usually uses the common meter in her poems, which is fun because you can do a little jaunt while you're reading them if you want, maybe even a tap dance. One of her most famous poems happens to be one of my favorites. I know I'm a poser and I'm not really emo. I mean, I don't even know three songs from any of the bands on my shirt, but I think it's really pretty and it's neat and I'm gonna read it anyway because I can, because it's fun. This is Because I Could Not Stop For Death. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. We slowly drove, he knew no haste, and I had put away my labor and my leisure too for his civility. We passed the school where children strove, at recess in the ring. We passed the fields of gazing grain. We passed the setting sun. Or rather, he passed us. The dews drew quivering and chill, for only gossamer, my gown, my tippet only tool. We paused before a house that seemed a swelling of the ground. The roof was scarcely visible, the cornice in the ground. Since then, tis centuries, and yet feels shorter than the day. I first surmised the horses' heads were toward eternity. I really love this sort of personification of death in poetry, which is really obvious if you look at me and everything I say because I'm one of those annoying fucks, you know what I mean? And a lot of people do go down that route when they're writing about death. It's a great route, it's a fun route, somewhere you should go as often as you can. <laughs> But I think what really separates this poem from the rest is that painting death as kind of slow and careful and caring. Death is a lot more of a friend in this poem. He's not a scary figure, he's not the grim reaper that we all know and we're all used to, especially in media. I think death is pretty consistently treated as this like brash, annoying, final thing when in this poem it's given a very different light, it's given that treatment of personification. She has a way of giving you a certain empathy for death, or at least a trustingness of death, you know what I mean? When you treat those emotions and that finality as more of just a person guiding you somewhere, and I think that's why it is so often seen in religion, but if you treat it as a person, as a guide rather than a villain, it comes out very differently. He's treated, in general, the concept of death as more of a delicate creature, as somebody that is personal and interested in you. I don't know, I love this poem. I think it's beautiful. It's one of my favorites. Next on the Emily Dickinson roster is Dear March, Come In, which is a lot simpler of a poem. It's a beautiful poem nonetheless, but it doesn't tackle those same subjects. It's just a nice nature-y poem. I mean, not really. It has a lot of levels to it, but whatever. I can dream. I can just pretend that I'm not going to be annoying about this. Anyway, here it is. Dear March, come in, how glad I am, I hoped for you before. Put down your hat, you must have walked, how out of breath you are. Dear March, how are you and the rest? Did you leave nature well? Oh March, come right upstairs with me, I have so much to tell. I got your letter and the birds, the maples never knew that you were coming. I declare how red their faces grew, but March, forgive me, and all those hills you left for me to hew. There was no purple suitable, you took it all with you. Who knocks, that April, locked the door. I will not be pursued. He stayed away a year to call when I am occupied, but trifles look so trivial as soon as you have come. That blame is just as dear as praise, and praise as mere as blame. There were so many poems I really wanted to include here, but YouTube's community guidelines like to fuck me up, so I couldn't, but this poem uses that same friendliness with forces that aren't quite human, and I love that. In my opinion, Emily Dickinson has always seen more of a poet that interacts with the world rather than writing about it, which is such a neat and beautiful style and I think it rings true for a lot of people because it feels personal. Her poems have a sense of peace to them no matter what topic she's writing about, which I find really interesting. It's such a almost nursery rhyme-like style of writing, which is not a bad thing, it's a great thing. She has a lot of work that's so digestible and easy to enjoy for almost anybody, but it's interesting and it's gripping. She's an interesting person to study if you've got the time to. 
That last poem, I feel like the line is such a kick or two because it's a bit different from the rest of the poems. You know, it goes into that more iodim style, I guess. That blame is just as dear as praise and praise as mere as blame. I love that line so much. It's so beautiful. I think the reason why I like poetry so much is that it really encapsulates feelings that they don't let you fully explore in a book without seeming like you're just monologuing on and on, which I do enjoy in a book, but you know, not everybody does. It's such an interesting art form because I feel like poets are always kind of put into one little box and there are so many different types of poetry that can be explored and it's so annoying because people always count it out. They think like they read one poem and they don't like it, but I'm being annoying again. We're going to move on to some Robert Frost poems, which are some of my favorite. I mean like all of these poems are in general my favorite poems. I don't like pick out poems that I don't like, but you know, you know what I mean. I love Robert Frost. I am just a poor little Victorian boy who doesn't know shit about shit, but Robert Frost's writing has such a special place in my heart because of how almost nostalgic his poems feel. They feel like memories in a way. They feel like paintings, almost. You'll see what I mean if you haven't heard them before in a minute, but they feel like art. This is Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening by Robert Frost. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near. Between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The voice cracks are really kicking in. I hope this is enjoyable. I hope this is audible quality. <laughs> God damn it. The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep, and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. I don't know if I have some delicately curated Instagram for you page, explore page, whatever, but I saw an artist tattoo the last stanza of this poem across different people, each person getting a different section, and it really solidified my love for this poem in a way that I didn't think it would. I'm a fan of tattoos, I have a good amount, so obviously that would hit me in a certain way, but I also feel like that visual of sharing art between people is so cool, and it also helps solidify how good that last stanza is. It's a very visual poem, I can see the elements so clearly, and I love that about frost poems. I tend to gravitate towards nature poems, so obviously I'm gonna be a frost bitch, but that last repetition is so beautiful to me. I feel like winter as a season is the best to convey that melancholy feeling other than fall. I like fall for that too. But this is such a well-written scene that you can really understand what he was going for there. You can see it all in your brain. And I have aphantasia, so I don't see shit in my brain, but like, I can still visualize it, kind of. I know exactly what's being referenced here, you know what I mean? If this person doesn't shut their fucking car up, I swear to fucking god, it's over. It's so over. I'm tired of this. I just want to be a little poet boy. Is that so hard? To wear a little beret and be a little poet boy? What's wrong with that? Let me know what your favorite poems from this are, by the way, and let me know what your favorite poems are in general. I really wanted to do the two-headed calf, but I feel like everybody's heard that. Everybody knows that poem, but maybe I'll do it later. I don't know. It's my favorite of all time. It's not a Robert Frost poem, so I have no idea why I started talking about it, but you know, whatever, it's fine. Anyway, next we have The Road Not Taken, which is one of his most famous poems, and maybe you've heard it before, maybe you haven't. Either way, I'm gonna read it to you, because you actually don't need any qualifications to read poetry, because I can do that for free. God does and has always feared me because of my innate ability to do whatever I want, so you know what? It's silly little poem time. Sing along if you know the words, I don't know. Anyway, The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost, let's go. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both, and be one traveler long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could, to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. I completely understand why this poem is as known as it is. It's one of the first examples of that phrase of taking the road less traveled, of course, that we now hear pretty constantly, but I still think it's one of the best examples of it. It's written out so perfectly, it takes a life of its own when you read it, and I think that's one of the most important things that a poem can do is just completely separate itself from the word almost. 
it's held a place in like the general pop culture consciousness for a long time and that is because it's well written because it's good like you cannot have poetry that leaves such a mark on the world and like people know this poem without even hearing it i mean you can have poetry that is known but doesn't leave a good mark on the world if you're gabby hannah or the author of milk and honey so that's fine but whatever it's fine i don't know what i'm trying to say here despite my terrible attempts to do so, is that it made an impact for a reason. It's become such a common way of thinking for a reason because this is a beautiful poem. When work like that makes a mark, it's doing what it was supposed to do. It's doing what the creator wanted it to do, which is awesome. And I love that. And I love Robert Frost poems and I want to get a tattoo of them. At some point, I have a lot of tattoos to get, to be honest with you. I have way too many. I need to book an appointment soon. I'm kind of working on that, but I don't know when I'm going to have time and it's so annoying. You know, as always, I have to go on about my own shit it so <laughs> if you want like a good time if you want to read some good old-fashioned fucking poems go read robert frost pages on the poetry initiative the poetry archive what the fuck is that thing called something it's really easy to find you can read almost all of these poems for free all of them actually i wouldn't be sharing them if you couldn't read them for free because i feel like blocking off art that is no longer benefiting the person who made it is stupid but anyway, yeah, read some Robert Frost poems, they're really good. Anyway, who wants poems by Mary Shelley's husband? Yeah, mm-hmm. Anybody? Cool, whatever. Here is Ozymandias by Percy Shelley, a poem you might know if you're a Breaking Bad fan and is also just a generally good poem. 10 out of 10. Love it. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survived, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed, and on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look upon my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains, round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare. The lone and level sands stretch far away. I never hear Percy Shelley poems like anywhere, which is crazy to me. And I mean, these are more classic poems. I don't have very many that are modern. <laughs> but I mean, with the impact that the Shelleys made, I mean, Mary especially, you know, with Frankenstein and all that, you know, it's one of the best Gothic literature works ever. It is the Gothic literature work. So, I mean, I feel like Percy should get a little bit more credit for being an amazing poet. Mary and Percy are both so incredibly interesting and have in tandem produced some insane shit. They're really interesting to research as well. I mean, none of these poets are necessarily like people we would look up to now, to be honest with you, which is like times change and things change. But I think a lot of their work withstands that. And that's some of the problems that you can come across with old poetry. It's like half of it doesn't, half of it doesn't work. But I think Percy Shelley's work, especially because he was an early feminist and stuff, really does hold up. As for the Breaking Bad thing that I mentioned, if you didn't know, Brian Cranston actually read this poem in a teaser for the episode called Ozymandias. And that's where the name it comes from so if you've never heard this poem and you've seen the episode now you know a little bit more about breaking bad but you can literally go and listen to him read it which he does a much better job than i ever will because he's brian cranston and he's an actor and i'm not so you know this is just me fucking around having fun and ozymandias is not one of my favorite poems specifically because of breaking bad but i do feel like it's a great example of a poem used so well in media Everybody on Earth, I think, knows at least a little bit about Breaking Bad, even if they didn't ask. Like, it's pretty much a public thing, it's pretty much a matter of public consciousness, so... We all know how Walter is as a character, and I don't want to go into the whole film bro analysis of Walter's character right now. I could, I could, and I will, but I won't. But, like, not only does this poem accurately reflect what's going on in the actual real world, it also reflects what's going on in Walter's head, how he believes himself to be this king of kings. And it's so well used in that scenario. It's such a good poem. It represents so much of that power hungriness, that belief that people are above other people. I like it. I love it. I think it's a great poem in whatever context you use it in because it can be used for so many different scenarios. It's this picture of the last crumpled remains of a man who believed he owned the world. And I always love that. I love that fall from grace. And I think it's beautifully represented, especially for such a short poem. You know, it gets to the point, but it's still regal. I don't know, it's a good poem, it's a great poem, it's a good, great poem, I love it. My fucking god, these children have gotta stop playing outside, and I know, like, I sound like the most miserable wench on this earth, but, like, please, you are screaming so loud, and I am so tired. <laughs> please, please, don't forget about the poor young adult in the other house that is trying to do some stupid-ass poetry reading. Please, don't forget about me, I'm begging. 
don't have fun. Poetry as a concept is really for miserable old wenches, and that's why I love it so much. Hope this helps. Anyway, here is Mutability by Percy Shelley. We are as clouds that veil the midnight moon, how restlessly they speed and gleam and quiver, streaking the darkness radiantly. Yet soon, night closes round and they are lost forever. Or like forgotten lyres whose dissonant strings give various response to each varying blast, to whose frail frame no second motion brings one mood or modulation like the last. We rest, a dream has power to poison sleep. We rise, one wandering thought pollutes the day. We feel, conceive, or reason, laugh, or weep. Embrace fond woe, or cast our cares away. It is the same, for it be joy or sorrow, the path of its departure still is free. Man's yesterday may ne'er be like his morrow. Not may endure, but mutability. I sound a little fucking stupid speaking in Old English, but it's kind of like cosplaying a woman staring longingly outside her window, so I'm gonna go for it. Rest in peace, Percy Shelley, you would have loved Game of Thrones. This poem is very lyrical to me. It feels like it was written as a reflection, a general gathering of thoughts, you know, which is what a lot of Percy Shelley poems feel like to me personally. I don't know, I like that style, I like that sort of strayness of thoughts and putting them all into this like beautiful little pile. I love that so much. And this one specifically is kind of reminiscent of the way that we turn sadness into art now, which is seen in a lot of gothic literature, obviously. That's what's so cool about it. It's very similar to like music we hear now. Everything on earth is kind of like reminiscent of something else, you know? We start somewhere and then we move on and we evolve and we do things differently. And I think gothic literature is a bigger foundation for things than we think it is. I've said it a million times, I'm not like a professor, I don't know anything about anything, I am just sitting here spewing my thoughts off, but you know what, that's fun too, that's exciting. You gotta have a dumbass in the room saying what they think so that the other people can look smart. I'm just doing a service to the world right now. <laughs> trust and believe, but I love Percy Shelley's work a lot, and I feel like if you are into gothic literature, you would really enjoy it. You would really enjoy, like, hopping on that train, and I think it's a fun thing to look back on. It's fun. It's cool, and more gothic literature should be showing up. I don't know. I just feel like poetry is one of the most beautiful things in the world. It's one of the most beautiful forms of expressing your feelings, and I really appreciate that we have so much of it to look back on. I think it's so neat. Writing in general is beautiful, and if you've never tried out writing poetry, I highly recommend you do because anybody can do it. That is a common misconception that people think like, well, I'm not a poet. Yes, you are. You can be. Just write a poem. It doesn't have to be good on the first try. It doesn't have to ever be good by professional standards. It can just be yours. It can just be something that you created, and I think that's the best part about it. You know, like, you don't have to do anything a certain way. Most of these poets were not looking to make a classic, you know what I mean? Like, they were just writing out their thoughts and feelings, and that's the best part about it. That's the best part about any writing. It's just, like, you're making something for you. You know, and that's always gonna be the struggle, is, like, no, you want it to be good, you want it to be perfect, you want to be good at what you're doing, and I don't think good has a classical definition. Like, are my videos good? I don't know. Some people like them. 9,000 of them for some reason, so you know what? That's good to them. Other people might think I make shit. And I'm one of those people, but you know what? That's fine. That's cool. You will never know if you like writing, if you think you're good at writing, until you try it. This video is a fair amount shorter than anything that I usually put out, so I hope that you enjoy it somewhat. I hope that it's something that you can find some sort of, I don't know, interest in. And if you like it, I will make more. I have plenty other poets that I want to get to. I want to do some Maya Angelou stuff. I want to do some Emily Bronte stuff. I don't know. I think it would be interesting. And I really appreciate you guys sticking around, I really do. Thank you so much, and I hope that this wasn't stupid, but even if it is, I don't give a fuck, so. Believe in yourself, believe in your creativity. NaNoWriMo is coming up, if you don't know, it's next month, it's National Novel Writing Month, so write a fucking novel, who cares if it's good or not, fuck you. And uh, yeah, thank you for watching this. All of the poetry, like I said, will be linked down below. Go visit it, go talk to it, go read it, go have fun with it, go put it in the frame somewhere, I don't know. I was gonna read some of like my own poetry at the end and then I just like looked at all of this and I was like, yeah, I don't think I fit in here. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you know what I'll tack on to the end of these classics? My own bullshit. <laughs> anyway, I've been rambling on. Fuck it, we ball. I hope you guys had a good time. Thank you for watching. I appreciate you and I'll see you next time with something that's not this probably. I can't just post an Animal Crossing video or it will kill me. Hope this helps. Okay, bye. Thank you to all of my members. I love you. Stay safe. Stay wonderful. Bye.